Uh, my goodness, Tesla up another 8% today. Um, it's been running up in the lead to the split. What, what do you make of all of this? Well, I think it shows you how strong a force momentum is. We talk about earnings and cash flows and fundamentals, but in markets, momentum can drive things uh, far more strongly than any other force. And right now, the, the, the force is with them, both Apple and Tesla. The force of buying is behind them. And I, I mean, that's why if you sell short in these stocks, you're asking for trouble, at least in the near term. So the stock splits then, as we've been saying, they don't change anything fundamentally, but what you're saying is that they're just adding to this momentum. How long does this last? And, you know, we heard from our Josh Lipton, Phil Lebeau, the reporters who covered these companies, that there are catalysts in the future, the iPhone 5G, right. battery day. Um, where does this all end? Well, remember, catalysts can cut both ways. Catalysts are never you know, uniformly good catalysts. So, so that when the new iPhone comes out, I mean, things are measured against expectations. And right now, the expectations are sky high for both companies. I mean, with Tesla, this has been a long-standing issue. For the last dozen years, the companies found a way to confound expectations. So there are catalysts coming up, and those catalysts can reverse the momentum. But, uh, you know, as I said, I wouldn't bet against the momentum right now. Starting to look at various uh, records fall, depending on how you slice it. Uh, for example, uh, the NDX as a percentage over its 200-day uh, is now nowhere near where we got in 2000. But market cap of all stocks versus U.S. GDP has eclipsed uh, March of 2000. So which of those analogs are you favoring right now as you try to take the temperature? I, I, I've never believed in this market cap to GDP measure. I know Warren Buffett likes it, but I, you know, I, I've never understood the fixation with that measure. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's nice to have something as a measure. But I do think that uh, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. As tech companies rise, many of the traditional measures of earnings, I think, understate earnings at tech companies. Your biggest expense at tech companies is R&D, and it's capitalized right now. So as we look at historic metrics, I mean, you can never ignore history, but I think blindly taking what we've seen in the last century and applying it to this market is just going to make you sit on the sidelines forever. And I think we have to be judicious. I mean, I'm not saying stocks are not, have not, are not outrun the expectations in this, in this rally, but I think we have to step back and say, hey, which of these stocks have outrun the most? Because some of them I can justify. I can look at the numbers and say, there is a reason why these stocks have gone up. And there's been a fundamental shift in this during this crisis towards flexible companies. And that's what you're seeing pay off. So, Oswath, which ones do you think have justified their run, off, run up? Well, I think I, I looked at just the, the FANG plus Apple and Microsoft last week. And it's surprising how close those stocks are actually to their fair values. I think I found Apple to be the most overvalued, but I found Facebook to be undervalued. So I think this notion that tech companies are just running up on pure oxygen, there's nothing behind them as I think misplaced. For the young tech companies, that might be true. For the older tech companies, these are money machines. The cash is flowing in and there's a reason markets like them so much. So you really are, a, you're a buyer of the notion that, um, that technology, we're in the, we're in the process of technology, technology changing the economy, changing the way in which we interact with the economy. And because of that, there is real value, even though we're seeing metrics maybe that we haven't seen in several decades. Is that a fair way to say it? I, I, I think so. And I think I, there's a very simple experiment that I suggest people run. I mean, I, two weeks ago, I took my every waking hour of the day and I kept track of whose ecosystem I was in. And for 95% of my waking day, I was in the ecosystem of one of those six companies I just listed, Facebook, Apple. So in a sense, we're already there as people. <laughs> the market's kind of catching up to what's become a reality for all of us. <laughs> I'm sure Zoom as well, Oswath, which uh, reports yep. after the bell. But it's one of these companies, too, that went public last year and has seen this enormous run up. So in that sense, too, last week we saw a slew of tech companies unveil their plans to go public. And I wonder if you think if anything has changed from last year. Last year, we saw sort of more public investors interested in 
profits perhaps over that growth at all cost model. But the moment we're in when, as you say, our lives are spent in these ecosystems, tech ecosystems, a lot of these companies coming up, particularly in cloud. Do you think that that has shifted? Do you think that public market investors are going to be more forgiving of losses, which many of those companies that uh, released prospectuses last week showed? And uh, every crisis leaves winners and losers. In a strange way, I'll take one of those companies that's planning to go public, Airbnb, and argue that Airbnb today is stronger than it was a year ago. It's a strange thing to say when people are not traveling, but here's why. I mean, it's all relative to competition. And this crisis has handicapped the Marriott's, the Hilton's of the world so much that it's given an opening for Airbnb to actually grow faster than it would have otherwise. So if you look at these companies in a strange way, the crisis has damaged the status quo so much that it's given an opening to these younger companies. And the other thing that I found unusual about this crisis is private risk capital has not left the game. It's usually in crises. Private risk capital drives up VC money, money coming to risky stocks, IPOs. That hasn't happened in this crisis. We can argue about why. But private risk capital staying in the game, to me, has been the biggest single story of this crisis because that's incredibly unusual in a crisis to have risk capital stay in the game. Right. But at the same time, they're going towards those cloud companies that are getting an opportunity amid the pandemic. But I do want to ask you about Airbnb. Yes, it may emerge from the crisis with more operational leverage efficiencies, but it took a big step down in valuation this past year, 31 or $32 billion to an $18 billion valuation. What do you think the market will pay for it? I think a market will play at an $18 billion valuation. I think Airbnb is actually priced much more attractively, attractively than Uber was when it went public. To be, to be honest, I think that if you can get in on the ground floor in Airbnb at $18 billion, I think it's a decent IPO. I mean, I still haven't looked at the numbers. So I can't tell you what, I, what, what my value is. I'm looking forward to the prospectus coming out because uh, if I were to pick one of these companies to put into my portfolio, I think it would be Airbnb.